Hello, um, a very warm welcome to you all for the sixth edition of Delighted Talks. I hope you all can hear me well. And um, today's topic would, today's theme that we go into is the history of good light beyond the visual spectrum. And if you are all wondering what the other five editions of Delighted Talks were, please feel free to check the Good Light Group's website and they have all the other five editions documented. And in the spirit of history of good light and beyond the visual spectrum, I'm reaching you from Berlin today and my good light um, looks like a cloudy sky outside today. And I thought I would um, share what my good light actually in terms of the visual spectrum looks like as an introduction. So I'm coming to you from Berlin. It's 3 p.m. late afternoon here. It's winter time. I have a cloudy sky outside. I'm looking at two of my screens here in my office space. I also have some electrical lighting on the top. And that's how my visual spectrum actually looks like a mix of daylight, some fluorescent and electrical lighting and some air LED light from my screens. And so you can see that I don't have so much of the near infrared or the UV, and that's how this visible spectrum pattern looks like. I get about 200 lux on my eyes and of a color temperature 5,600. So I really invite you now to maybe reflect on what your good light actually looks like right now. Whether you're starting your day or you're ending your day or like me, you're in the mid afternoon and whichever part of the world you're actually uh, joining in this session, maybe have a moment to see what actually your good light looks like. Um, and while you do that, um, I would like to also take the opportunity uh, to actually thank the four partner organizations that make the Delighted Talks possible. The Good Light Group, the Daylight Academy, the Society for Light Treatment and Biological Rhythms, and the Luger Research. So the program for today looks like this. So we have the welcome and introduction, uh, which I'm uh, doing. I'll be also your moderator for the day. And my name is Priji Balakrishnan. We have two fantastic talks lined up. One is by Professor Timo Patonen, who's from the field of medicine and psychiatry. And he'll be giving us a talk about the full daylight spectrum from a historical perspective. We have a second talk by Dr. Anne Behrens, and she's from the field of chemistry and uh, material sciences. And she'll be giving us a talk about beyond the visible, the proven effects of near infrared light on health and well being. And a bit of housekeeping for the day. So, what we will do is after the two talks, we will go into a panel discussion, and that's where we will pick up your Q&A. So feel free to uh, leave your comments or ask questions while the talks are going on and while the discussion is going on, and I'll pick this up in the panel uh, sessions. And you're free to also comment to each other's questions, and you're also free to rate the questions so that I can take it in a priority order as well. Okay, so... Once again, um, a very warm welcome. And my name is Priji Balakrishnan. Uh, a bit of introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher, and I'm currently based at the Technical University of Berlin. I have a background in architecture, and I specialized and practiced in the field of sustainable designs for our built environment. And it's during my PhD that I, I actually went into a deep dive of daylighting and being able to predict daylighting in buildings. One of the works that I was uh, looking at is how do you measure and model light through trees? And for the past two years, my research has really looked at how can we not just simulate the quantity of lights within or daylight within the building, but how can you also predict the spectral characteristics of daylight? And really looking at how can we provide this location-specific information so that designers have this tool to be able to predict the spectra of daylight. Um, I'm also an active member of the Daylight Academy and the International Commission on Illumination. So when we were actually presented with this topic, um, it gave me an opportunity to sort of say, what was actually a light exposure through the ages? And when I thought about it, I came up with three maybe most significant factors that probably influenced our light spectrum and specifically the spectral a pattern of this light exposure through ages, the design of buildings, specifically the windows, our work culture, 
So the way the office work that we do and technological advancement, and in this context, specifically electrical lighting. And just to give you an introduction, and it's a very, very brief introduction uh, of this here, what our light exposure might have looked like through the ages. And if you take the cases of buildings and windows, you can see that in the prehistoric times, we probably started with just punched holes in the walls. So we didn't have a glass uh, for the windows. We really had uh, just small windows and probably security and safety were the most significant factors. So it wasn't even these holes were meant for some amount of daylight, but not really for daylight and working inside uh, with daylight. Predominantly the work was outside. We were working outside and our light exposure would have been daylight and fire. And when carpentry and the tools became more sophisticated, we probably had like wooden shutters to start to close these kind of punctures in the holes for some safety and security. And around Renaissance, glass was always there, but of course it was a very, very expensive material. And you can see glass being used. This is Villa Rotunda that was built in Italy in the 16th century. And this was a, quite a famous uh, Renaissance uh, house that was there. And you can see the usage of glass being, or glass panes coming to these, uh, uh, to these windows and architectural features, but only for the wealthy houses at that time. And really uh, through the ages, you can also see that our windows got bigger. Uh, when we, we had bay windows with the Victorian houses in the 19th century and with the industrial revolution, uh, manufacturing glasses and being able to mass produce it would have really helped us have bigger windows. So predominantly during this time, if you think about it, our light exposure would have been daylight. We were working outside for most part of the time, significantly daylight. And then during the night, some form of light, either candlelight or kerosene lamps, and only, it's only towards actually the 19th century that we had um, electrical light uh, come into our domain. And you can see that from the mid to the late 19th century, when the commercialization of light bulbs came into being, that was actually the first also very significant and key factor where our length of working day increased. Um, and you can see that all through the 19th, 20th and 21st century, which we are in now, um, our environments have been dictated with the capability of us being able to light spaces with electrical lighting. And you can see this New York Times office in the 1940s, this General Motors office uh, in the 1950s to the 70s, cubicles being invented in the 1960s. And even my office space when I was based in Singapore in the 2017, and now my office space in 2023. So all this while, predominantly a light exposure has been, and I would say it's, it has been more dominantly electrical lighting than actually daylighting. And even if you look at the 21st century, we have uh, come a long way also to have tempered glass for our facades, and we can have really full glazing for our facades, but we also end up with problems where sometimes there's too much light for the kind of work that we do in front of screens and shades come down in terms of cubicles. So all these really do impact the kind of spectral light exposure that we get on the eyes. And if you look at, it's not just about the electrical lighting, it's also if you look at the development of electrical lighting through time, uh, the kind of electrical lighting that you are under also impacts what kind of spectral light exposure you have. So we have the tungsten filament bulbs that came in early 1900s and incandescent lights, light exposure looks like that. So very low in the blue region and quite high in the red region, also going beyond the visible spectrum over here. And fluorescent lights, they, they were there even in the past, but they sort of take over these incandescent lights during the 90s. 1950s, there's an oil crisis happening somewhere in between, and really for energy efficiency, CFLs come into the market, and 1980s, even now in some of our homes, we do have fluorescent lighting, and that's how the visual spectra of uh, fluorescent lighting looks like. So not so much of a continuous spectra, but you do have a lot of dips and peaks in some of uh, some of the blue, the green, and the red region, and this is uh, a white uh, fluorescent light. 
And we had a big breakthrough if you look at the LEDs when the first uh, blue LED and then very uh, soon following with the white LEDs were invented in the 1990s. So not so long ago, just 20 years ago. And it became the most popular use for uh, around 2000 when it was introduced uh, for the residential use. So always residential architecture is a, is a way for us to be able to see what where the technology gets commercialized and how it enters the market as well. So really we've been dictated by these kind of uh, spectras of ele electrical lighting. And just to give you an example, I thought it would be a fun idea to look at what my visible sp uh, spectrum, uh, spectrum pattern in a day looks like in the 21st century. So this is in Berlin in winter in 2023. And you can see when I start my day, I have a mix of daylight because and white LED. I don't have so much light at home uh, to start my day at 8 a.m. because it's winter. And then that's about two hours of exposure. And when I decide or sit next to a window or try to go outside, that's when I get a full spectrum uh, solar or full spectrum daylight exposure. And that's about 20 minutes in my day. I come to the office, I start working, and I have a mix of this daylight and the uh, LED light uh, from my screen. And that's maybe two hours. And if I decide to take a walk during my lunch uh, and the walk has a lot of trees, then that's the pattern of uh, daylight spectrum that it looks like. Very soon, there is not so much light um, exactly in a sort of situation that I'm uh, uh, presenting to you today is that I have a lot of light from my fluorescent electrical lighting in office and the screen LED. And by the time I walk home, um, I have a mixture of all these three different kinds of light, the high pressure sodium lamps that are the street lighting, incandescent lightings that are sometimes there in the corridors of residential spaces. And then when, when I go home, I have an LED that's a bit of a warm color and that's about four hours of exposure. And so if you look at it, even me who's so aware of uh, lighting in my space, I have about 25 minutes of a full uh, spectrum daylight exposure. And every other part of my day is very much dictated with where I am, what kind of electrical lighting I do have in my space and what kind of windows I have in my space. And I just want to end with this last slide where I thought it would be very good because, um, so I said my in the beginning of the slide that my good light actually looks like this. Um, it's very much uh, contained to the visible spectrum. I have almost nothing in the near infrared or the UV. But if I could actually change my desk and if I would be facing the window while I present to you guys, I would instantly get double the amount of light. I would get a huge peak in the near infrared light, still not so much UV. And if I were to decide and be so bold enough that I step outside and did this presentation completely outside the four rooms of my office, then I would have a full spectrum daylight, even though my light quantity doesn't increase, but I have the full uh, spectrum of that daylight. So that's really, um, and I think this is really gives you an overview of how different uh, visual spectrum uh, has been through the ages.